Councillors say a new model of public safety will be created in a city where law enforcement has been accused of racism. City Council President Lisa Bender says attempted incremental reform has failed. Our commitment is to do what's necessary to keep every single member of our community safe and to tell the truth that the Minneapolis police are not doing that. Our commitment is to end our city's toxic relationship with the Minneapolis to Police Department, to end policing as we know it, and to recreate systems of public safety. Tens of thousands of anti-racism protests have taken to, protesters have taken to the streets across the UK to seize the momentum of the movement sparked by the killing of George Floyd. In Bristol, demonstrators toppled the statue of a prominent 17th century slave trader and dumped it in the river. It's reignited the debate about whether other historic reminders of Britain's role in the trade should be removed. Europe correspondent Linton Besser reports. 12 days on and 6,000 kilometres away, the British came in their thousands to protest the killing of an American and to demand institutional change across the UK. They gathered at the US Embassy in Vauxhall and marched across the Thames to Downing Street. Just because of the colour of our skin doesn't mean we should be treated any differently and things need to change. In Bristol, protesters attacked the statue of Edward Colston, a notorious 17th century slave trader. They pulled down the bronze sculpture, rolled it through the streets and pushed it into the Avon River. It represents years of hurt and just a lot of emotion that and hatred that has been built up inside of us. We've internalised for years. That coming down today hopefully signifies change. It's almost two weeks since George Floyd's death and people of colour in Britain remained distressed and angry, even defacing the statue of wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill. In Glasgow, they tried to protest responsibly. It's amazing to see people already taking social distancing measures seriously and doing the best they can to stay safe today. The protests have been largely peaceful but the government has condemned the protesters for breaching coronavirus regulations. It is shameful and quite frankly that is why these protests should stop and they should not go ahead and people must be mindful and stick with the rules that have been put in place. I have a younger daughter as well and I do not want her to be standing in the street like me having to fight for rights. It might have been America who lit this flame, but Britain has enough of its own dark history to ensure these cries for change will only continue. Linton Besser, ABC News, London. Almost a 1,000 people across the country have been recognised in today's Queen's Birthday Honours list. Former Prime Minister and notable monarchist Tony Abbott is one of three who've received a Companion of the Order of Australia. Unsung heroes have also been recognised, many whose work has been more important than ever during the coronavirus pandemic. Amelia Terzon reports. Tap. Tap. Dance therapist Kim Dunphy is doing things differently during the pandemic by taking sessions outdoors. And reach. Her positive attitude, now recognised with the Medal of the Order of Australia. It was a great um, surprise and honour. I was over the moon for her because Kim deserves everything and everything. In the central desert, despite lockdowns, another honours recipient, Sarah Brown, is keeping renal services going in remote Indigenous communities. We've always been an organisation who celebrates the good stuff and doesn't have a whinge. This year, almost 300 people are being honoured for community work, many of them unsung heroes. But there's plenty of familiar names on the list too. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who controversially reinstated knighthoods and made Prince Philip a sir. I believe this is an important grace note. He's now been given the top honour, a companion of the Order of Australia. Australia's longest serving female federal politician, Bronwyn Bishop, also gets an AO. Min Long is also honoured for her work in business and diversity, a topic she's rallied on amid concerns about COVID-19 racism. Well, I hope that it's 
a reminder for women of colour coming through that they are capable of great things and for all people of colour. Professor Marcia Langton has been made an Officer of the Order of Australia. Her message as sharp as ever. Do not kill Aborigines. How hard is that? APY Land's artist Vincent Namajira is hoping his nomination will inspire the next yeah. generation. For who they are, where they come from, you can break the boundaries. And for stopping bad hair days, even during the pandemic, Brisbane hair salon mogul Stefan Ackery. I just wish my mother was here to see it. Amelia Turzon, ABC News. You can keep up to date at news.abc.net.au and on iview. Here are the top stories on ABC News. The federal opposition says the government needs to make childcare more affordable after it confirmed its free childcare scheme will end next month. The program was implemented during the peak of the coronavirus pandemic to keep the sector afloat amid plummeting demand. The Education Minister Dan Tian has announced the childcare subsidy scheme will resume on the 13th of July. A disturbance at Sydney's Long Bay Jail appears to be over. Tear gas was fired into an exercise yard where inmates had gathered. Officers in riot gear then entered the area. Inmates were ordered to the ground and were handcuffed before being taken back inside. Corrective Services is yet to confirm what sparked the incident. New Zealand will lift all domestic COVID-19 restrictions at midnight. There are now no active cases of the virus in the country and no new cases have been reported for more than a fortnight. The only restrictions to remain will be international border controls. And hundreds of people from all walks of life have been included in this year's Queen's Birthday Honours. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott has received a Companion of the Order of Australia, with Indigenous rights activist Marcia Langdon and cricketer Michael Clarke also receiving nods. Unsung heroes who have been on the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic have also been recognised. Over the weekend, tens of thousands of Australians gathered in cities and towns in solidarity with anti-racism protests sweeping the United States. In the past three decades, 432 Indigenous Australians have died in custody and protesters and advocates are calling for systemic change to the way Aboriginal people are treated by police. For more, I'm joined by Barrister Joshua Creamer, who specialises in discrimination and human rights cases. Joshua Creamer, thanks so much for your time tonight. Were you at the protests in Brisbane on the weekend? I, I attended, Karina. Yes, I did. And what was the mood like? It was, it was really empowering. Uh, 30,000 people, uh, most of those, 90% of those would have been under the age of 30. Uh, in such a peaceful, respectful environment, uh, out there advocating, uh, joining uh, an issue which is important to them. Do you feel like this moment where the national attention is focused on this issue, that there will be an impetus for change? No, I don't. I don't have any confidence in our political leadership, Karina. Uh, they've been asleep at the wheel on this issue. And I think it's reflected in the outcome of the class action by the Northern Territory Cattlemen's Association last week. It all reminded us that uh, in the event of abuse directed towards animals, uh, governments are prepared to take swift, swift and decisive action. Uh, no political leader has stood up uh, in the last few days and really dealt with this issue. All they've done is chastise and criticise protesters. Well, what do you make of the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ken Wyatt, who says the federal government has fully or mostly imp implemented 90% of the recommendations in its purview from the Royal Commission? When you work in the area, you do understand that uh, the majority of the recommendations at both state and federal level have been implemented. But I think 30 years on, we have to realise that uh, the Royal Commission hasn't achieved the results that we all would have hoped. Uh, we're still seeing significant numbers of deaths in custody uh, and we need to do something about it. I wrote an article last week you know, on indigenousx.com.au and I called for two things. I called for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be treated humanely uh, in these instances and secondly, I called for a better uh, standard of investigations into these in, uh, deaths in custody. Yeah, I read that piece last week. 
tell us about your alternative proposal because you're not convinced that in the event of an Indigenous death in custody that police should investigate police. No, that's not my criticism. My criticism is the standard of investigation that's been uh, deployed in these instances. The Royal Commission calls for a coronial inquest. And if you've dealt with that process, you'll see, you'll understand it's really a second, a substandard investigation. And law is a funnel. Whatever information, evidence comes in the front end dictates the outcomes at the back end. And if, if police conduct an investigation or prepare a report for the coroner, they're not looking at all the facts. They're not looking at possibilities of a crime or, as the Royal Commission calls for, investigating the death as if it was a homicide, so a criminal offence has occurred. And so, really, uh, and, and that really impacts why one, you understand why we haven't seen uh, any, any criminal prosecutions in, in respect of those 430 deaths has been almost nil. Yeah, you wrote in the piece that the only solution is for an independent investigative body not made up of former police officers. How would that work? Uh, you see models in the United States where the Commonwealth or the, the uh, federal uh, powers have authority to come in and investigate certain events or certain crimes. Uh, nothing dissimilar here. So in the event of a death in custody, you would have a federal body with state teams that are deployed to conduct these investigations and they conduct them at the highest standard. They don't conduct them as if they're preparing a report for the coroner. And the problem with the coronial process is in three or four or five years time when a coroner makes a decision, any, any possibility to gather evidence at that stage about a crime uh, that may have occurred is significantly diminished. And so you don't believe that there's any appetite for this kind of change from federal leaders? Federal and state, uh, I'm here in Queensland. I haven't seen uh, any political leaders in Queensland or uh, any at the uh, federal level uh, engage with this issue in the last few days. If you see the information that the Premier is putting out, she's touting uh, you know, the Australia Zoo, the AG's talking about growing gardens in a backyard. Uh, they're not engaging with the 30,000 people that uh, stood out uh, in Brisbane and marched on this issue. Uh, and nobody is grappling with it, uh, particularly at the federal level as well. So how, how do you get this to on the agenda? Well, this is... Uh, people need to maintain moment, momentum, but really we need uh, pressure on our political leaders now. Uh, and whether that's our, our leaders out in the community, Indigenous leaders or other leaders, I mean, this is an issue for everybody. I, I see that come out, the AMA come out in the last day or two and crit criticise protesters. Well, how about the AMA stand up and, and tackle this issue? This is the type of leadership we need. And we need people to, to knock on the doors, talk to their politicians, say enough's enough. 30 years now since the Royal Commission, it hasn't achieved the outcomes we need. Let's put that on the shelf and let's do something different. Yeah, you mentioned the AMA. They came out today and said that all of the protests should consider, protesters should consider self-isolating for 14 days because of the risk they now pose to the community. Is that not a reasonable request or you think that they shouldn't be focusing on the health aspect of the protests at all? I think protesters should follow the advice of uh, medical experts and if if the um, chief medical officer or the uh, deputy medical officer or, or state politicians are coming out giving advice in respect to COVID, my advice is to follow their advice because they are the experts. But I would like uh, bodies like AMA and others who have come out in criticism this week to also adopt that same level of energy and vigour to tackle this issue of deaths in custody.